the, uh, the last time I was here was, was Christmas. And um, since then, as you guys uh, who were there then can now see, my wife is no longer pregnant. She did have the baby. Thank God in this heat that she is not pregnant. And um, we now have a baby girl, Lily Marie Josephine. We probably told you we were going to name her uh, Isabella, um, but that changed. And then we couldn't decide on a middle name, so we went with two. Um, but she is a precious little girl, and our little boy is doing great. He's uh, almost two. He runs faster than me, is sneakier than me, is just about smarter than me. So uh, he's doing really, really well. And, man, uh, I tell you, I just got back from, um, from South Carolina, matter of fact, uh, about, what, 1030 last night. Uh, we took 19 teenagers to uh, Centrifuge, which is um, a, a church camp put on by the Southern Baptist Convention. And uh, I learned really fast that uh, I am no longer a teenager. Yes. Um, they also run faster than me, are sneakier than me, and definitely smarter than me. Um, but it was a great group of kids. Um, you know, all the pranks and the games aside, uh, we had a great time. Well, we had a great time doing those too. But, um, and so if uh, you'll see, I, I have some water with me today. Um, on the way home last night, I pumped myself full of caffeine between coffee and five-hour energies uh, to be able to put up with the ride home, so I'm a little dehydrated this morning. Uh, well, this morning I want to share with you um, a few things before we actually get into the message. I, I want to share a part of my life with you um, that's going to lead into what we're going to talk about today. Um, I was uh, at about six years old when my parents got divorced. Uh, one of the earliest memories that I have is backing out of our driveway in uh, Bordentown, New Jersey, and uh, waving out of the window to my father, saying, you know, we'll hope to see you soon, Dad. And he was waving back to me, saying, I'll be there in a few weeks. And uh, both him and my mother knew that that wasn't going to happen. And uh, the longer I waited, the more I realized what was happening. And uh, that's really after some extensive, uh, extensive counseling in my adult years, um, that's really what I've stemmed uh, back to um, where all my problems began. You see, I was searching for a love that just wasn't there. I was searching for, for a father figure who wasn't there. Now, my dad wasn't a bad guy. Um, he called once a week. He paid child support faithfully. Matter of fact, he paid over. Um, what he was required to do. And so he wasn't a bad guy. He just wasn't there. And, you know, as a, teen or as, you know, as a teenager, but as a child growing up, um, you know, I'd watch my friends. They would go out with their dads. They'd learn how to hunt. They would learn how to fish. They would learn how to fix cars. All things I still don't know how to do to this day. Don't give me a wrench. Don't give me a screw gun. I can't fix anything. Um, and so, I watched this growing up, and uh, it began to, to develop in me this, this, this broken heart, this hurt in my life. And so I, I wanted this father figure, and I began to search for it in all the wrong places. Um, as I shared with you on Christmas, um, a lot of those places were in, uh, in guys who were older than me that led me into lots of trouble, into drugs and into alcohol, and into a life of um, a criminal lifestyle. And so, you know, this whole time searching for this, this love, I, I, I didn't know it, but what I was forming within myself was this idea of worthlessness. Now, you see, in, in, today's, in today's modern culture, we don't have the idea of worthlessness um, or anyway of being unworthy. Uh, we don't have a real good idea of what that is. We, we equate being unworthy as being undeserving. And what, we're gonna sh what I want to show you today is, is that there's a difference between being unworthy and being undeserving. You see, I, I began to feel unworthy of my dad's time and of my dad's relationship. I began to feel worthless. Now, when we look at the word worthless, we take a look at the two words that are in there, worth and less. And all of us have experienced worthlessness. 
And then my, you know, my degree might be a, a, a lot deeper and a lot worser than some of, uh, some of uh, other people's. But I want to I wanna ask you this. What have you felt worth less than? And if it could be anything, maybe, um, maybe your, your parents spent more time at work than they did with you, and you felt worth less than the time they spent at work. Maybe it was a, a, a spouse who spent more time doing something that, uh, that, than, than to spend time with you. Uh, my, my wife might say that she probably feels worth less um, than a lot of the things that I do because I spend a lot of time doing things. And so it, it, it's not, and, and those things that I do necessarily aren't bad, but when I put a value on them above my relationships, uh, people begin to feel worth less than the things that I do. And so there's a sense of value there. And then we think about the other idea of being unworthy or being undeserving. And being, being undeserving is getting something that we don't deserve or being treated a way because we don't deserve. And, and you know, today's modern culture has more of a focus of an undeserving, um, especially in, in, in American Christianity today, um, than it does of the actual value. But working down at the source, and, and when, when you see somebody at the bottom of the barrel, you begin to see that it's not necessarily a message of undeserving as much as it is a message of value. See, when a person finds themselves at the bottom of the barrel, um, they, they know they don't deserve. Uh, you don't have to tell them that. But they still search for that sense of value, that sense of worth. And, and a lot of times, in everything that they, they, they search for it in, they always come up worth less than. And so today, I want to take a look at, at, at what our birthright is. And, and how much value our birthright has and how much we don't deserve it. So if you will, turn your Bibles open to Luke chapter 15. Now, most of you are probably familiar with this set of scripture. And truly, there's three parables here and... and Really, they shouldn't be read separately because it's three stories, the same message. Okay, so we're, we're going we're gonna to look at verses 18 through 32, but I want to go ahead and read the first two parables also. Now, all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near to him to listen to him. That's Jesus. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began grumbling, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable, saying, What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the open pasture and go out after the one that is lost until he finds it? Now, something I, I want you to see here, okay? All right. Something I want you to see here is that this sheep was all number one was already in the fold. This sheep was already it was already the shepherd's sheep. OK. And so the sheep gets lost and needs to be found. And, and the sheep's value to the shepherd, just one sheep is worth leaving the ninety and nine to go find the one. And when he has found it. Let me move my post it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulder, rejoicing. So we see a shepherd that when he has found the sheep that was lost, he didn't just toss it on his shoulder and, oh, you know, you stupid sheep, you should have, you shouldn't have gotten lost, and and, and and brings it back into the fold. He rejoices because there's value in finding the lost sheep. He's happy that he has found something that he has lost. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. 
So not only does he rejoice within himself over what was lost, but he also gathers his friends together and says, you rejoice with me. So what he's saying is, it's not just something that's valuable to me as a shepherd, but something that's valuable to us as a community, to us as, a, uh, as believers, to us as, as a community of faith. When, when somebody comes back into the faith, we rejoice together because it's, it's, it's you know, if, if, if they come to me and they say, you know, Pastor George, I've been backsliding and, and I, I really need to recommit my life to the Lord. And, and we go through some prayer and some counseling and the person recommits their life. It, it isn't just for me to rejoice, it's for all of us to rejoice. It's for all of us because we're all gaining something here. We're all getting to share in the riches of receiving something back to us that was valuable. Jesus tells the, the, uh, the Pharisees and the, and the scribes, he says, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety and nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Now imagine who Jesus is talking to here, okay? He's talking to the Pharisees and the scribes, the people in Jesus' day who, after all, were all righteous. Now we know that none are righteous, no, not one. So when Jesus says this statement, when we read this statement, we can begin to see that Jesus is, is saying, you know, this one repentant sinner is worth more than anybody who thinks that they are righteous. For they were lost, but now they are found. The second parable he tells them, now again, don't see these as separate parables. Uh, Jesus is telling the same story in three different ways. He says, well, what about this one? Or what woman, if she has ten silver coins and loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? Now, love, how much do you like sweeping the house? Okay, now you guys got to understand, all right, we have a two-year-old. Sweeping the house is no easy task. I don't know if this lady had any kids, but to sweep our home or to vacuum or to clean up, you have to get a bunch of toys off the floor. And that's no easy task because my son, as we're picking up, he's spitting out. The more toys we pick up, the more he puts out. He doesn't like to pick up yet. You know, and and if, we can, if we can get him to pick up, they only stay picked up for a minute and he's dumping his toy box out again. But the, the, the lady, she, she begins to sweep her house. Now she has nine other coins. Let me ask. Let me let me ask us. If, if we had, if we had ten quarters, and we lose one quarter, how many of us are going to do some spring cleaning to find that one corner? I, I'm not. I'm just. You know, I'm going to go over to my quarter jug. I'm just going to grab another quarter. You know, I'll find it later. But it was important for this lady. It held value that she finds this one coin. So she cleans the whole house. I'm going to start losing coins on a regular basis. <laughs> so she, and she, she, and she cleans into, until she finds it. And, you know, uh, uh, another thing in, the, in these two parables, you know, the, the, the shepherd, he, he searches until he finds. The lady, she cleans until she finds. There's value in that. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and her neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I have lost. Now, Im imagine if your neighbor came over to your house. Hey, George, rejoice with me. I found the coin that I lost. I'm going to be like, okay, you know, you, you, lo you found your coin. Great. You know, good, good, good job. Uh, I, don't, I don't think we need to celebrate that. But there was something about finding something that she had lost that brought value not only to herself, but value she felt she needed to share with her friends and her neighbors. 
So in the same way, I tell you, there is more joy in the presence of angels over one sinner. Pence. You think the Pharisees and the scribes are getting the picture yet? Now for today's text, the story of the prodigal son. Now it's kind of it's kind of amazing how Jesus tells these three parables, and in the last parable, did you know that there's three parables? In the last parable, in the parable of the prodigal son, there are three different parables. Today we're going to take a look at our perception of our worthlessness. Verses 11 through 19 say this. And he said to them, A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided up his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country, and there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now, when I read this parable, one of the reasons why this is still my favorite, my, my, my favorite telling of the gospel is because that was me. And for most of you, that was you. Now, I, I got saved at 13 years old. I always believed that there was God. My parents raised me, you know, in a Catholic church. And, you know, after we moved to Florida, my mom quit going. Um, you know, my dad didn't know why we were Catholic. My mom didn't know why we were Catholic. All of a sudden, we were just Catholic. And so my mom quit going. And, and, and I always believed that there was a God. And I always felt like God was tugging on my life. And at 13, I, you know, I, I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I asked him to come into my heart and, and live in me as his home. And I wish I could tell you that my life was peaches and cream a after that, but it wasn't. It wasn't. My, I began to live a life of squander. And God continued to, to, to call on my life. And I continued to uh, live loose living. And so when I read this, uh, you know, I, I, I see that the one thing I, I, I've been searching for, I was squandering. See, it wasn't about the wealth that, that, that the father split as much as it was the son left home and the relationship was broken. Verse 14, it says, now, when he had spent everything, a severe famine had occurred, and in that country, or in that country, and he began to become impoverished. You know, it's it's amazing that when we begin to squander the things of God, that God will allow us to get to that point in our lives where we become so impoverished that all we, that that we have nothing left. That the only option we have is to is to look to Him. And working down at the source, you know, you kind of get the, when you, when you encounter people who really don't get homelessness, you kind of get the, well, they need to just get up and get out and get a job kind of attitude. And though that is, that, that, that's right, you've got to understand that God has them right where they have them because the one thing that they definitely, desperately need, they haven't found yet, and that's him. He's got them in a place of impoverishment because no amount of, of, of employment, no amount of, of home fullness, no amount of riches, no amount of education will ever fix homelessness like encountering the true and living God will. So he went and hired himself out to some of the citizens in that country, and they sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods of the swan, that the swine were eating. And no one was giving him anything. You know, and that's, 
when, when we're at some of our poorest moments, I've been there. Th that's kind of our attitude, isn't it? Nobody will give us anything. We, we take a look at just some of the people that I serve, just a, a minority of them, but it's, a, it's an attitude of entitlement on some of them. I need somebody to give me something. And, and so we, we, we think to ourselves, well, well, if we just meet their need, that, they will, that their life will improve. But we think of meeting their need as putting money in their pocket, putting them into a house, getting them a job. And we forsake the one true need that they really have. And so it goes on to say, but when he came to, to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread to eat? But I am dying here with hunger. I will get up, I will go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against you and against heaven. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. Now that's where we find our plight. We go out in life and we squander the opportunity that we have to, to be good Christian men and women. And when we finally come to our senses, the best that we can come up with most of the time, especially if you've had the experience that I did, is, you know what? I'm not worthy enough to be one of God's sons, so I'll just be a servant. God, just tell me what you want me to do, and I'll go out and do it. You know, that's the way I approached ministry that, for my first couple of years. That's the way I saw it, that, that I, wasn't, I wasn't good enough. I wasn't worth being in the family of God. But I could serve him. I could serve him, and I, I, you know, I had the attitude of, I'll, I'll just go out there in all of my worthlessness, and I'll go out there and I'll serve God. And the sad part is, is that in today's, in today's Christian culture, that's what we call ministry. And we're missing one of the most vital pieces of ministry when we have this perception of worthlessness. Now remember, we're not talking about deserving. We're talking about value. Okay? We'll, we'll talk about deserving in just a few minutes. We're talking about value. So when I say worthlessness, I'm talking about we equate our lives with no value at all. And that is readily acceptable in Christianity today. Now I want you to understand something. When, when, when Jesus said that the son said he was no longer worthy. That word is axios in the Greek. Axios. Here's what it means. Weighing or having weight of another thing of a like value or worth as much. So basically what this son was saying was, Dad, make me your servant because I am not worth as much to you or to your family to be called your son. That we would become God's servants. That we would have the idea that all that God wants with us is to go out and do for him breaks the relationship that he has set out for us. It separates us from the idea that we actually belong to him. Now remember, Jesus said, I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. So what, what, what we get, this idea of worthlessness in Christianity today, this, this, this younger son mentality is that I'm no longer of any value to God because I've, I've just messed it all up. You don't understand what I've done. 
I've messed it all up. So it, it'll be j- good enough. It'll be good enough for me if God just lets me serve him. And then God becomes a taskmaster. And he has so much more in store for us. So now, if you will, I I want to skip the middle portion. We'll get back to that. But I want to take a look at our perception of worthiness. Or our perception of deserving Starting in verse 23, it says, oh, no, hold on. I'm sorry, verse 25, it says, Now the older son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, He heard music and dancing, and he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what those things could be. And he said to him, your brother has come home, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he, the brother, the older brother, became angry and was not willing to go in, and his father came out and began pleading with him. And he answered and said to him, Father, look, for so many years I have been serving you, and I have never neglected a command of yours. And yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. For when this son of yours came home, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And the father said to him, Son, you have always been with me. And all that I have, all that is mine, is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice. For this brother of yours was dead and has become or begun to live. He was lost and he is now found. I want you to take a look at something here in this set of scripture. Okay? The brother the older brother's out in the field and he's he's working and he's worked for God or he's worked for the Father all his life and he's worked hard. And he's proud of the hard work that he has accomplished. And he, he knows, his, you notice in, in the beginning set of this, of this parable that the father split the wealth among them, the father and the two sons. And so the brother, the older brother knows that the younger brother is out there squandering. After all, if you have siblings, you find out when they're doing wrong, don't you? People love to come up and tell you, hey, you hear what your brother George is doing? Ask my sister. Ask my little brother. People come up and tell me, hey, you know what your little brother's doing? Hey, you know what your sister's doing? You, you can't get anything by your brothers and sisters. Okay? So now imagine the, brothers, the older brother's attitude. Now, in, in, in this culture, okay, you got to understand, in this culture that Jesus is telling this story, if you were to ask your father for your inheritance before its time, and he were to give it to you, that was it. You were written off. You were no longer a lynch. Or you were no longer whatever your family namesake was. That was it. You were done. And then, for you to go out and begin to squander that, imagine the shame that would come back to the family. Imagine the, the, the tisking that would be going on when you entered the synagogue or when you entered the church. Oh, there's George. Man, you heard what his son's out there doing? Man, he asked, he asked George to split the inheritance, and George gave it to him, and he's out there ruining it. Man, 
Imagine what comes along with that for a parent. Imagine the older brother. He's going, yep, that's right. My younger brother's out there ruining everything. I'm the good son. I'm the one holding the family name. The older brother becomes angry that the celebration is going on. Now remember, the, the key points in all of these parables, that when something lost is found, the whole community rejoices. And the brother comes home, and he's, he asks one of the servants, he says, what's going on? They say, you know, your brothers come home. They're throwing a party. And he gets angry. He's not even willing to go in the house. He's not even willing to go in the house. So the father comes out. And who does the son, who does the older son begin to accuse? The father. See, the word for not willing in this portion of scripture is thelo. Now listen to what thelo means. It means to will to have in mind or to intend these four things to be resolved. The brother wouldn't go in the house. He didn't want to resolve anything. How many of us are so unwilling to be unresolved? I know I am. When conflict or, or, or discrepancies come into my life, I'm not so willing to go into the house sometimes but willing to hold on to that unresolution until the Father begins to work onto my heart. Or how about this? To will or to have in mind or to intend to desire good. Man, the brother comes home, the party's going on. The younger brother has come home, he's been restored. And the older brother has no desire to participate in any of that. Anger and frustration have turned into bitterness and hate. Which leads us into our next one. To will, to have in mind, or to intend to love. The bro older brother had no intention. He, had, he did not have the mind to or the will to love his younger brother. After all, this whole time the brother was out there squandering his living, the older brother was building all that hurt and all that, 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 that bitterness inside for his younger brother. Ask dad to split the inheritance and you're going to go out there and waste it. How could you? You're a disgrace. That's probably how he thought of his brother. And then the last one, the fourth one, Thilo, to have in mind to will or to intend to take delight and pleasure. The brother did not want to party. No, if the brother was anything like I might have been, he wanted to go in there, grab his little brother by his neck, drag him out, and begin to wail on him. After all, I've wanted to do that to my little brother. And recently, <laughs> telling you, the only thing that has stopped me is Christ himself. Uh, sometimes some of the hardest ones to love are in our own family, boy, I tell you. So what is love? You know, we read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and, and we get this idea uh, and this picture of what love is. And, and, and the crazy thing is, we can go through this list of, of what love is and check off, yep, I do that. Yep, I got that one. Yep, I got that one. And so quickly, especially if you're anything like me, you'll skip over this one. Let's, let's read them together. It says, verse 4, love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, is not provoked, now here comes the tidal wave, and does not take into account a wrong suffered. Now there, there's where the arrow goes through the heart. Because, you know, we, we can be patient, right, Andy? 
<laughs> we were trying, right? We're trying, okay? We can be kind. We can, we can put aside jealousy. We don't have to brag or be arrogant. We don't have to act unbecomingly. We don't have to seek our own or be unprovoked. But boy, you want me to do what? You want me to not take into account a wrong suffered to me or my family? At the, the youth encounter we were just at, the pastor, his name uh, was Eric. I believe his last name was Reed. He, uh, he pastors Journey Church, North Carolina, I believe. And um, he shared a story about the birth of his son. And he shared a story that, that drove a, 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 just a nail right into my heart. His son, before he was born, they had an ultrasound. And they saw that one of his kidneys was full of cysts, cysts. And they were going to have to be drained. It was actually um, causing a a growth in his stomach. And so they they told him, you know, it's it's an okay procedure. You know, uh, we do them all the time. Um, You know, as soon as he's born, we'll wait till he gets to some, you know, good weight. And we'll just go ahead and do the surgery. Well, instead of being born at 40 weeks, he was born at 30. He was two pounds. So they had to wait for him to, to get some weight on. They got waited until he was about five pounds, and they did the surgery, and the surgery went well, and uh, they had to wait for him to, uh, to urinate. And uh, one day goes by, no pee. Another day goes by, no pee. And at the end of the third day, the doctor come to the conclusion something was wrong. And so they, uh, they do another ultrasound. And uh, <laughs> they find out that the doctor took the wrong kidney. Not only did the doctor take the wrong kidney, but he said that his son had what's called a horseshoe kidney. And if you don't know what a horseshoe kidney, I didn't know before this, it was when your two kidneys are connected. So they actually ended up taking both kidneys out. He began to describe the images of what was going through his head of what he wanted to do to this doctor. He didn't, he didn't spare any graft of causing and inflicting pain onto this doctor. He said it was the darkest time in his life. God had a lot of work to do in his heart, and, and the Lord began to do that work. And uh, about a year and a half goes by. Now, th- now this child has, have, has to have dialysis on a regular basis, okay? He doesn't have any functioning kidneys. So he's not even a year old yet, okay? And uh, as God, and he said, you know, this affected his whole family, his whole family. And as he began to, uh, to allow God to work on his heart, he come to the point where he, he was able to forgive this doctor before God. Now imagine, he's, he's at this children's hospital every day, and he hasn't ran into this doctor yet. He gets to the point where he's able to forgive, and he said a, a short time after that, he was riding, he was holding his son, taking, you know, just taking him for a walk, gets into the elevator, starts heading down. The elevator, elevator door is open, and guess who's standing there waiting to get on the elevator? But the doctor. They caught eyes. They knew who each other were. And he asked the doctor if he could speak with him. He said he didn't know how the conversation was going to turn out. The doctor had a little look of shock on his face. He pulls the doctor aside, and he just tells the doctor, you know, I don't want you to carry this guilt around any longer um, for what's happened to my son. And, and God has dealt with my heart, and I, I just want you to know I forgive you. And he said the doctor just broke down and started crying. He said he's been holding guilt over this this whole time. And just so you know, the, the, the mother, um, they tested the parents to see if they could become a donor. Um, the first test, uh, they, were not, they were not a match. Um, last ditch effort, they tested again, and the mother was a match. The son is uh, operating on one kidney today um, and doing well. And then I take a look at what love is. And does not take into account a wrong suffered. 
and I, and I, and, I, and I look into my heart and and I ask myself, how how often do I practice that? You know, too often do we see forgiveness as, well, I'll forgive you, but I don't want anything to do with you. And every time you come around, I'm going to remember what you did. Love does not take into account a wrong suffered. And that's, that's, that, I mean, that, that's incomprehensible for us today. This brother, he was so caught up, the older brother was so caught up on the wrong that the younger brother did that he could not see that his younger brother was lost, but now is found, that he was back home. He was so caught up on this wrong suffered that any love that he had for his brother was so hardened that he couldn't even draw from it anymore. He had broken the relationship. We take a look at what the uh, at what the, the older brother says. Listen to what he says to the servant. Or I'm sorry, listen to what he says to the father. Here, here's, here's where the, the relationship is broken. The younger son, the relation, you can see that the relationship between the younger son and the father is broken because the younger son says, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Call me your servant. Relationship broken. The older brother tells the father, this son of yours, this son of yours, it's no longer his brother. You see, the older brother has disowned the son, or the younger son. The older brother has disowned his little brother. He no longer says, hey, my brother messed things up. He says, this son of yours, he tells the father. But you see, God has so much more in store for us than our idea of worthlessness or our idea of worthiness. God has more in store for us than for us to just be devalued into servants. And he has more in store for us than to, than, than, than to have an idea of, of, of how much we deserve because of how much we do. See, for God, it's not so much about what we do and what we don't do, but about what he does and what he has done for us that we could not do for ourselves. So let's take a look at how the father, the third part of this parable. Remember, three parables. The last parable tells three parables. All the same story. Let's take a look at the father's perception of our birthright. Starting in verse 20 of Luke chapter 15. Remember, the son... The younger son says, I am no longer worthy, or I am worth less than to be called your son. Make me one of your hired men. And so he got up and he went to his father. But while he was yet a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion on him and ran to him and embraced him and kissed him. Let's take those one at a time. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him. What do you think his father was doing every day? On the porch, looking out the window, whether he was going from the living room to the kitchen, he'd, he'd just take a look out the window to see if his son was coming over the hill. His father was constantly thinking, when is my son going to come home? I'm waiting on my son to come home. He's heard all these stories about his son living in the pig pen, his son not having anything to eat, being treated like a slob. And the father finally, one beautiful, awesome day, finally sees over the top of the hill, finally sees the head beginning to rise. And as, 
as he begins to see the shoulders maybe, he, he, he recognizes the face or the body shape. And, and imagine the palpitations of his heart. Imagine the thoughts going through his mind. Am I, am I really seeing this? Is this really my son coming over the horizon? And he began to feel compassion. He began to feel like he could say within himself, I do not hold my son accountable for the wrongs done. He began to, to focus more on the son coming towards him than going away from him. And he ran to him. And he ran to him. Now, in, in today's in today's uh, Christian culture, an, an idea we, we get this idea that, that, that somehow we find God, but God finds us. We get this idea that, that we come to him not realizing that he has already come to us. That he has already come to us. You see, when I read that he ran, you know what I think about? Those two words, he ran, bring ideas of Jesus going to the cross for me. That, that, that's my idea of the Father running to me. When I read those words, I see Jesus on the road to the cross running to us. And he embraced him. Now imagine, his son, fresh out of the pig pen, dirty, covered in God knows what. And the father didn't care. The father embraced him. The father held him tight. And he kissed him. And he kissed him. I, I, I can't even imagine some of the thoughts that must have been going through the father's head. You know, just this past week, for the first time, over the telephone, my son said the three most beautiful words I, I, I've heard him ever say. It was, I love you. Matter of fact, when I heard it, I didn't even think it was him. My wife had to tell me it was him. And I wonder that in this moment of embrace and in this moment of this kiss, if every memory begins to flood back from all those wonderful times with the sun. So let's take a look. The father says, and he said to the son, I have sinned, or the son says to him, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But, father, but the father said to his slaves, quickly bring out the best robe. Now I want to tell you, the best robe, stole. Stole, the best robe, is the robe worn by the kings, priests, and persons of worth and rank. And he put it on him. A ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. Do you not see that we are clothed in the robes of Christ's righteousness? I want to three things with you. I want to leave you the relational truths of our birthright here. The father says to the son, you cannot be my servant. You are my son. He puts the robe, the ring, the sandals on his feet. The father didn't want a servant. He wanted a son. He took someone who felt worthless and gave, them, gave him things of worth to show him how much he meant to him. My son has come home. This son of mine, he says in verse 24. In verse 31, he tells the older brother this. You have always been with me. You have have always been with me. And we could have killed a fatted calf anytime you wanted. 
And in verse 32, he tells the older brother this. He says, this brother of yours has come home. You see, this is a, a, a picture and an image of God restoring the relationship. The relationship of, of, of the lost value and worth. And the relationship of uh, our perceived ability to earn anything. He tells the older brother, it's not about what you've done, but about who you are, that we, why we could have killed the fatted calf anytime. You see, because worthiness comes when we are in the presence of the Father. We don't deserve it by any means. But there is a value attached to who we are. Because if, if we were just if we were just worthless pieces of garbage, then John 3.16 doesn't hold as much weight because it says that God so loved the world, his creation, he so loved it. There's value in that. We didn't deserve it, okay? We didn't. The older brother shows us that. We did not deserve it by anything that we have done. But that doesn't mean that we don't, we're not valued. That, is, that doesn't mean that, that, that when, when a sheep is lost, that the shepherd doesn't go out and find, that when a coin is lost, that the woman doesn't clean the entire house. That doesn't mean that when the son has squandered everything, that the father isn't waiting and watching for his son to come home. Or that the, the older brother who's in the home already has anything that he has earned in the relationship, but that it comes with the presence of of the Father, when we are in His presence, when we are in His household, we are worth so much to Him. Will you pray with me? Father, we, we thank You that before we could ever love You, You loved us. We thank You that, that You found it so much your son's life to pull us out of our out of out of that just black hole of sin and father we just ask that that as we go through our lives here in this current time father that that those feelings of worth, worthlessness or those feelings of, of 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 deserving lord that you place us in your presence so that we might see our value in who you have made us to be in your presence and in your presence alone. And in your son's name we pray.